Hey everyone, this is Nick and oh boy do we have a lot to talk about this week. Because we have Framework announcing a new 16 inch laptop with replaceable GPUs and a ton of expansion slots. We have a big big update to Nextcloud including AI and a SharePoint competitor. And we have Twitter announcing that they will open source their algorithm at the end of March. And we also have Wayland screen sharing fixed everywhere, including on Discord. We have AMD FSR3 and GNOME 44 and this segue to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Linode. Linode is the only solution I use to run my own Nextcloud server and my only Office server as well. It's a super easy solution to deploy basically anything you want in one click. They have a huge marketplace of applications you can host, from Nextcloud, WordPress, Drupal, GitLab, or Grafana, to gaming servers for Minecraft, Arc, CSGO, Rust, Valheim, and more. They take care of all the configuration for you. All you have to do is click the thing you want to deploy, fill in a few details, and your server is up and running. And once everything is live, it's still super easy to manage your servers, to upgrade or downgrade them, add some storage, back them up, and get help if you're stuck. I've been using Linode for years now, and I can only recommend them. If you want to give them a shot, click the link in the description below, and you'll get $100 of free credit to get started. So, Framework, the company that makes the ultra-repairable and modular Framework laptop, announced a few things this week. Now, first, let's get this out of the way. There are new 13th gen Intel boards and new AMD ones with the 7000 series CPUs. So you can upgrade your current laptop without buying a new one. You can reuse the old board in another device as a mini desktop, for example. But what's way more interesting is the announcement of the Framework 16, a brand new device that will have upgradable graphics, as in you can swap in some dedicated GPU modules at the back of the device. It will also have six expansion slots, more than the 13 inch model with its only four slots, and it will also have hot swappable keyboard modules with the ability to add a numpad on the fly, on the right or the left, or to move the touchpad to the center or the side. And they will even offer keyboard options with a super key instead of a Windows logo. And it will also have that all important PCI port at the back to connect all the replaceable GPUs, but also other peripherals, like for example, more batteries. We don't know which GPU they will use, how you will be able to source them, but it's a very interesting concept that I really hope that they can achieve. They are also open sourcing a bunch of parts of the laptop, like the firmware for the keyboard, the input modules, the expansion bay modules for the GPUs, and other PCI peripherals, or even the expansion cards designs. So basically, anyone will be able to contribute modules, GPUs, or other expansion modules to framework laptops. And I really, really love what they're doing, and I truly hope that they can achieve this vision. And I also truly hope that Linux will be a first-class citizen on this device, because it sounds like a complete dream to me. Like being able to have enormous battery life with an additional module at the back when I just need to write stuff or when I'm moving around, and being able to swap that for a full GPU when I want to game, when I'm plugged in, or when I want to do video editing, that would be absolutely wonderful. Now, Nextcloud announced some more good stuff with the release of Nextcloud Hub 4. And the main focus is, as it seems customary now for everything, the main focus is on AI. They implemented what they called intelligent features with a smart picker, which is basically a context menu that works across applications and lets you use AI in your daily workflow by just clicking that context menu entry. Now, it includes, for example, text to speech using Whisper, which just lets you type using your voice. It also lets you generate images on the fly using Dolly 2 and Stable Diffusion if you run that last one on premises. They also include a chat GPT-3 to generate new text in documents or the various office suites they support. The smart picker will also let you share tasks, next cloud tables, map locations, collective pages, peer tube videos, Mastodon accounts. They will let you translate with Nextcloud Translate, which is a new tool based on DeepL. They also introduced the new Tables app, which is an alternative to SharePoint. 
it lets you track data, building data structures, and it lets you create small applications without any code, any development. And you can connect these small apps to other Nextcloud components. Nextcloud Files also got the ability to name older file versions. Nextcloud Talk lets you create breakout rooms, which are smaller offshoots of main conversations to split up large meetings or virtual learning environments. And you can also now record your Nextcloud Talks calls. The Mail app got support for shared mailboxes and S-MIME support, plus new text templates. Nextcloud Office now supports end-to-end -end encryption, with support for uploading files to an end-to-end -end encrypted folder and sharing end-to-end -end encrypted documents. The text editor now tracks collaborative editing with multiple cursors in real time, and they also improve performance a lot specifically for Nextcloud Talk, with reduced loading times, reduced server load, and reduced notification delays. They say it's up to 99% faster. And of course, depending on how you installed Nextcloud on your server, you might already have the update or not. For example, I use the Snap, and so I'm probably going to have to wait for around a month for it to be available. But I can't wait to play around with the new Tables app to try and build some small dashboards and some small apps for myself. I think it will be really cool. And I'm also interested in these AI features because they brand them as ethical AI, but they seem to use the exact same AI that everybody else does, which is definitely not ethical in any single way. So I'm gonna look into that. Now, if you remember back when Elon Musk said he wanted to buy Twitter, he also said he wanted to make the recommendation algorithm open source. And up until now, this has not materialized, but it looks like it will before the end of the month, at least partially. Musk tweeted that all the code used to recommend tweets will be open on March 31st. And he said, prepare to be disappointed to someone asking him to open source Twitter, which could mean that either the code isn't great or that it will just be a small part of it that gets opened or that it just doesn't hide anything weird and so everyone will be disappointed because it's just based on likes and retweets. No details were provided on the license the code will be released under or where it will be accessible or the rights users will have to reuse it, share it or modify it. And we also don't know if they will allow contributions to it. This is still an interesting move because it looked like Twitter was going more towards a closed source route with them shutting down access to their API and killing the whole ecosystem of apps and useful bots that used it. They said they wanted to make that API accessible for a fee, but this hasn't materialized either. So it will be interesting to see where that code lands. Will it be more on the free software side where it can be reused and shared? Or will it just be open source as in you can look at it, but you can't really touch it all that much? We'll have to see. And I'm also sure we'll get plenty of deep dives looking into what and how Twitter recommends tweets to its users. And I'm sure plenty of people will find something to be offended by politically or otherwise. Now, one of the biggest hurdles of Wayland just disappeared, and that's screen sharing. While screen sharing from apps that run natively under Wayland works like a charm, apps that depend on an X server running with X Wayland generally have issues like Discord, for example, in that they don't see any Wayland window as shareable. They can only share other ex Wayland applications, which is definitely not ideal. Thankfully, a group of developers have tackled this issue with something called X Wayland Video Bridge. This thing just makes Wayland windows visible in the window picker for screen sharing from X Wayland applications. It is as secure as screen sharing under Wayland is using portals, and it's getting its data through Pipewire. Of course, any other X application will be able to snoop on the contents of what you're sharing, just like they can on X11. There's no way to bypass that, really. Performance seems excellent with negligible latency and no extra CPU usage. And the good news is you can already run it right now. The bridge is available as a flat pack only for now because it depends on a newer library that hasn't been released or packaged yet and that the Flatpak can include. You will need to run the bridge in the background, though, with a simple command line that you can set to auto start, and everything should work well after that. Now, it's still in alpha, and it's unclear if it will remain a separate tool or be part of a desktop environment or distro in the future, but it is great news nonetheless. So if your only remaining complaint with Wayland was screen sharing from apps like Discord, 
well, you don't have any complaints anymore. Give it a shot and let me know down there in the comments how well it works. Now, this week we also saw the release of GNOME 44 with a bunch of quality of life improvements. The quick settings are now more legible and descriptive. They can now handle background apps in a first step to try and replace notification tray icons, but it's just not there yet. The file manager can now show thumbnails in the file picker. Gnome software has a toggle to let you view free and open source apps only. You can disable the overlay scroll bars or the mouse pointer acceleration, and the settings got a bunch of redesigned pages for accessibility, mouse and touchpad, or sound preferences. You can also now configure WireGuard VPNs and share your Wi-Fi password through a QR code. Epiphany was ported to GTK4 and received a bunch of performance improvements, and most core GNOME apps received some small updates as well. Now, of course, this is just a very quick overview of everything that changed. If you want to go into more detail about all of this, I have a dedicated video. You probably already watched it if you're interested in GNOME, and if you haven't, it's linked in the description and in the card right there. There's a new vulnerability on Android that concerns users who like to take screenshots and share them. To summarize, using the native cropping features on Google Pixels, but also other Android phones, a lot of the data of the original image was kept in the PNG file and easy to recover. It just didn't delete the information that the crop removed, but kept large portions of it. Which means if you used it to share cropped screenshots of personal info or sensible data, anyone might be able to see everything you thought was cropped out. The vulnerability has been patched in March's update for Android, fortunately, but all screenshots cropped before that can still be uncropped. And this thing got the adorably impossible to pronounce nickname of Acropolis, and it affects Google Pixel users, but also some non-Pixel Android phones and some custom Android ROMs. Some sharing services would remove the compressed or unused data from the images, but for example, Discord doesn't. It only seems to affect PNG screenshots, not JPEGs, and the issue appeared in Android 10, so a long while back. And what's worse is, the issue has been fixed since the end of January on Google's side, but they didn't release the fix until March. And what's even worse, if you're using Windows 10 or 11's snipping tool, it has the same issue on PNG screenshots. The issue has just been fixed on Windows 11, but it still isn't on Windows 10 as I'm recording this. So if you like to share a lot of screenshots that you usually redact by cropping them, it might be time to go and delete them from virtually everywhere you share them, especially Discord, because anyone could just uncrop them and yeah, that's bad. And let's finish this with some gaming news. First, there's a new change planned for the AMD drivers for Linux that should improve the experience on recent AMD APUs, starting with the Van Gogh architecture, which notably is used by the Steam Deck. There's a new interface for adjusting and setting thermal throttling, which lets temperatures be read in milli degrees Celsius. So it means systems will be able to adjust throttling a lot more precisely and squeeze every bit of performance they can out of the chips. Wine 8.4 was also released this week with the initial steps for the Wayland driver that will enable Proton and Wine to run Windows games as native Wayland apps and get more performance out of it. It also includes fixes for Thief, for Hard Truck 2 King of the Road, for the Amazon Games client, whatever that is, for Spore, for Crisis 2 Maximum Edition, or StarCraft Remastered. And finally, AMD unveiled a few things about FSR 3, their super sampling technology that lets you run games at lower resolutions while looking good on higher res displays. They're introducing interpolated frames that apparently lets them get a two times frame rate boost, basically by automatically generating frames in between the ones that are actually rendered. So basically the game could run at 30 FPS and be rendered at 30 FPS, but appear to run at 60 thanks to every other frame being guessed by the algorithm. Now, of course, this introduces latency, as these frames are not real, in the sense that they don't reflect what you're actually doing. They're just created automatically to fill in the gaps and increase the frame rate. FSR 3 is open source, as is the new FidelityFX SDK that gives developers easy ways to integrate this technology. 
And of course, this might be really, really cool on lower powered laptops and handhelds like the Steam Deck. Yeah, you saw that one coming. You could run the game at 30 FPS, but it would feel like 60 and it would give you a way better experience using less power and having more battery life. Sounds really good. Like this segue to today's sponsor. If you're looking to replace your main computer, maybe it's time to stop looking at devices made by Windows manufacturers and time to look at devices made specifically to run Linux from today's sponsor, Tuxedo. They're based in Germany, but they ship to most countries in the world and they make laptops and desktops that ship with Linux out of the box, out of a selection of popular distros. They have a big range that should have something for every price point and every need, whether you need a laptop, a desktop, an affordable one or a super powerful one, a workstation or a gaming device, they have everything. And all of their laptops are openable, upgradable and repairable with the battery, the SSD and the RAM all being user serviceable and sometimes even the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth card. So if you need a new device, you plan to run Linux on it and you want to support Linux's development, Click the link in the description below and get yourself something from Tuxedo. They're really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, well, you can always dislike it and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really enjoy the channel and you want to support it, well, there are plenty of links in the description below for PayPal, LiberaPay, YouTube memberships, uh, Patreon, super thanks whatever, plus my social links. You know what to do, they're all down there. So, thanks everyone for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!